Okay. Well, welcome everybody and, and welcome uh, Harriet Washington. Uh, Ms. Washington, I, I first would like to just open up with a, with a sincere thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, it's an amazing work. Uh, a group of us for the past uh, four to six weeks have been reading this book and it, and it really has been eye-opening. And I feel uh, very much practice changing, if not life changing for, for those of us who have. So I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, your research, uh, you, you so objectively and clearly uh, break things down as far as the, the historical um, conditions that, that lead to uh, malalignment between medical advancements and uh, throughout history, the devaluation of black people and black bodies and black lives. And it just gives such a rich historical context and thus the contemporary context as to why so many, why so many barriers do exist today. And um, for me personally, I mean, if nothing else, just a, a greater sense of empathy uh, to what we sometimes see as resistance or um, um, we're gonna talk later about overreaction versus rational reaction uh, to, to care. Uh, especially that that resistance to care where it, where it affects chronic illness, which mm -hmm. is treatable and leads to shortening of lifespans over years and uh, an end of life care too. So, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me, Dr. Becker. It means a lot. Thank you. It, uh, it is my pleasure. It's, it's really my honor uh, to be part of this, uh, um, this big day. I mean, you just did a one hour presentation. You've got a, another presentation to the community later today. So I'm just, I'm honored to be part of this. And thank you to the CGI group for asking me to participate. So I have a few questions here and I got a feeling a few more will pop up as we go. So um, mm -hmm. we could start kind of from the historical uh, concept. Uh, what was the inspiration of the book? And when did it start popping in your mind is there's something here that I need to write about? Well, you know, I could go back pretty far. The first mm -hmm. thing I first I remember being concerned about this issue was I was um, an undergraduate. I was studying um, English literature, 18th century. I loved it. But for some reason, I kept finding myself in the part of the library where there were um, accounts by doctors of treating patients in foreign lands. That was so attractive to me. I couldn't stay away. You know, like their stories were fantastic. You know, the titles were things like my patients were Zulus and Burma doctor, right? And they kind of melded this like romantic swashbuckling mentality with bringing medical care to people who hadn't had medical care. But, you know, as time went by, it became a little bit more discerning. And I began seeing that beside the attractiveness of these stories and what at first looked to me like a great nobility, you know, that someone would actually leave their comfortable European or American um, town to go to a, practice in a rice paddy or an African village. But then I began seeing that their, the way they talked about their patients and subjects was disrespectful and seemed to have a certain assumption that they were not superior by dint of their education or their exposure and privileges, they were, they thought they were superior by dint of uh, who they were, inherently superior, you know, and as that became more and more emergent, I find, I found it troubling. Then I was working as a, at a student job in the hospital, which turned into a full-time job in the hospital that I loved. I was running the poison control center, but as much as I liked working in the hospital and as, as um, exciting and engaging as I found the work, I was troubled by what I was seeing there. I was seeing that same mentality. You, there are a lot of physicians working there, a lot of um, you know, researchers working there who I knew to be nice people, but I also per picked up on their, um, you know, kind of a, their superior attitude toward their subjects and patients. Um, Sometimes it was like, took the, like a benign form or like, you know, kind of laughing about the gullibility or the perceived naivety of their patients, you know, but sometimes it was a nastier, uglier form, you know. Um, for example, 
oh, she's screaming and hollering like that just for show. She's not really in pain, that kind of thing. And I thought, it's exactly what I used to see in those old books. And then I began realizing that that mentality was a common mentality shared by a lot of healers who otherwise I admired, you know. And then the, uh, I think the big click moment was I got, an, I got some old file cabinets. Um, they were like donated to us by radiology. They were like a real medical apart, department. We were like the poor stepchildren in the poison center. And I'm opening these old file cabinets, door struck. I finally got it open. All these old file folders from the 70s were there. 70s and 80s, and um, they were it was they were of kidney transplantation patients, people who were hoping to have receive kidneys, and and um, nephrology had not known they were there, or they wouldn't they wouldn't have given me the cabinet, of course. But I was nosy. I read every single one, <laughs> and um, I began to see that there were thick files and slim files. The slim files were pa patients who didn't have a social profile that made a case for transplantation. You know, the thick files said, oh, he's got insurance. Uh, he's a wonderful person, a member of the Lions Club. His loving family is there to help him through the whole process. He badly wants to live, that I got not a lot to live for. And some others that had a social profile, there'd be one thing on it, Negro would be stamped on it and nothing else. You know, no advocacy for the person getting it. And then I found one in particular that stopped me in my tracks. The pay, it was stamped Negro, but I had read enough to see that this fellow, older gentleman, had insurance, had a family, but there was no advocacy for him. And then the, in terms of the plan for him, it was very simple, one sentence. You know, the plan was to help him prepare for his imminent demise. It was signed by a doctor I knew. I knew him socially. I looked up to him. He was, I admired him. Uh, his wife had been a friend of mine. He was a very unusual person. He was a Christian. He was deeply ethical. And he had had an um, interesting background. He'd been teaching Latin in a boys' school, decided to go to medical school, and took all the requirements in one year. And um, he's somebody I knew. And I could not reconcile that signature with the person I knew. And I think for the first time I realized it's not a problem of, of like some, you know, arrogant miscreants. It's a problem that can even affect people who I know to be good people. And that's when I, I just sort of felt like, like I've got to get to the bottom. Of it. I've got to explore it. When I hear that story, I imagine you can obviously see like this mythological, uh, you know, the clouds part and the, the this <laughs> rays of sunshine and the yeah. eyes opening and you, you speak a lot about, you know, in your early history as an undergraduate, uh, reading stories, but then seeing at minimum a sense of disrespect for the people in, 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 the, in the books. And maybe then the logical pathway from disrespect to devaluing to de dehumanizing uh, people. And, and, and you write so much about that uh, in, in the book. Uh, was, am I reading that right? Is that kind of a, um, was your thought process too? Well, you know, I think I'd be hard pressed to say what came first, disrespect, you know, dehumanization, but you're right, they're related in exactly that way, you know? And um, I think what, I, what surprised me and galvanized me was I saw the attitudes, but it's when I realized the attitudes came from a place of science. That's what shocked me. Mm -hmm. When I read about the yeah. uh, 19th century physicians um, and scientists uh, who were like considered the best in the world, if not the country. And um, the fact that they had actually codified this inferiority of African-Americans scientifically and said, well, these people are not the same species as us. They're not as intelligent as us. Their brains are not highly developed. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, here is a framework for this attitude mm -hmm. toward people of color. And it's being buttressed by scientific, a, a, a veneer of scientific, um, you know, research and data, but really it's pure bias. Yeah. As a physician reading this, as a, as a white physician, it just, I think it, it gives pause to, you know, I, I talk often about as a physician, you stand on the shoulders of giants of the, the medical knowledge that we have gained and, and hopefully then we advance throughout the course of our career. So our, um, you know, future colleagues will, will know even more, but I mean, the, the book here, 
I mean, there's, I believe, over 100 pages of notes. It's just incredible the amount of detail and the, uh, the, the scholarly research that you applied to this. And um, again, just, just it, it makes it so undeniable how throughout so much of history, uh, black people and black lives and black bodies were somewhere between disrespected, devalued, or just subhumanized. Right. And, right. Um, very, I, I am curious, how long, how many years did it take to compile? I mean, again, over 100 pages of footnotes here. Um, Roughly, how many years was this in the making? I actually had to um, delete, I don't know how many, but like I had to delete hundreds of footnotes because the book had grown too long and my editor insisted, I would never have done that today. But you know, um, it only took me two and a half years to actually write. But I could argue that I had been collecting information since the 80s, like the early 80s, you know, when I worked at the Poison Center. So I'd been amassing information forever. And, um, but then when I began to write, the floodgates opened and um, the book would have been much, much, what well, was originally much longer, but you know, mm-hmm. it would never have sold <laughs> at the length that I ended up writing it. So, but you know, the, um, the density of footnotes was necessary because I knew um, from oh, yeah. talking to um, experts in history of medicine, a lot of skepticism about it, you know, and I thought they're not going to believe me unless I document it um, and document it in an unimpunable way. You know, mm-hmm. it had to be resources that people would actually respect and, and not question. So if we could, let's talk more about that, because the skepticism, in, including, you know, you mentioned, you know, everything that's footnoted here, these are things we know. There's a lot more we don't know that isn't recorded right? and, right. and, and, and um, um, stories that are passed down through oral tradition leading to decision-making today and the concept again of th- that concept of overreaction versus rational reaction, mm-hmm. right? As, if I, as a white doctor, only know what I read in textbooks, but patients come to me with oral tradition passed down through generations and, and, and I don't know, and there's a gap, what appears to be an overreaction, like to your point, you talked about Tuskegee. If that's all one knows, and you know that's that's mm-hmm. what most of us know, that what we're experiencing is an overreaction to one study that was isolated. It's done over, and thank goodness that's done with. But again, that's not the uh, right. The real and also, you know, the belief that African Americans are overreacting to that one study, you know, mm-hmm. which is not the case. And it's Mm -hmm. amazing to me that like, you know, this week I've spoken to news outlets and every time I have to tell them, no, it's not Tuskegee. And usually they don't listen to me and they draw parallels to Tuskegee, Mm -hmm. you know, but um, I think eventually if I keep at it, they might listen. Well, hopefully we can uh, help you keep, keep at it. Um, Moving on, maybe, uh, uh, or changing gears just a little bit, I I am curious, um, since the book was printed and and released in 2007, the the reception from the medical community, uh, maybe organizations like the AMA or medical schools, what has been the reception? Well, you Uh, can maybe, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's um, interesting because initially, there there have been pockets of resistance, you know, Mm -hmm. some resist. And um, initially, it was almost funny because whenever I would go and do grand rounds or give a lecture somewhere, I would not whenever, but often, I would see that there were um, there would be some older white men in white coats in a defensive posture with their arms crossed. tradition of, of sims and i know that he's been a medical hero so he's mm-hmm. been a hero of theirs and they didn't like they didn't take kindly to my criticizing him mm-hmm. i understood that but um you know frankly if one has the data to buttress what one's saying then that goes a long way to you know resolving the resistance because i actually became back then quite adept at answering questions about the history of anesthesia, because they would often say, well, there was no anesthesia then. He couldn't have given the woman anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I said, well, he wrote in his memoirs that he thought about giving it to them, decided not to. 
I said, plus it, what it did abound, you know, what they didn't understand was that there were any published reports until 1846, but that didn't mean that doctors weren't using it. So um, after a while, I didn't hear from them anymore, you know, after I resolved that question and that they were the minority. The problem is that I don't know how people reacted because I didn't really hear from people um, very often who didn't like it. You know, like when I would give a talk at the beginning, there would be some pointed questions, but you know, I was able to respond to them and then I didn't hear them anymore. Doesn't mean that people were, were you know, medical people were all accepting it. They just weren't confronting me. So sure. well, well, what I, speak I, I, I do, do want to say though, that I do think that with time, because it's now been 12 years, Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's a lot less resistance. And um, I think people are, are more ready to hear this unpleasant history than they were back then. I want to circle back to that in, in a little bit, because that I, I'd be curious, you know, with contemporary um, atrocities and events in, in, in you know, in this year. Um, so I want to I want to circle back to that. Um, but before I do, you know, you talked about pockets of resistance, um, not hearing much from, you know, more from um, folks who appreciate the research here. But, but there was a story, and I believe it was to get the, uh, the, the, the image. Um, Tom was the artist, the picture right. of Sims doing Robert the uh, um, surgical procedure. Um, and a pharmaceutical company was resistant to allowing you to use uh, their, their images, correct? That's right. They refused me permission. Um, actually, what they did was, now, they acquired the image. Someone else had commissioned it, but mm -hmm. they now owned it. Um, and I knew two writers who had used that image on the cover of their books. So I thought it would be routine. I approached them and said I wanted to um, use it on the cover of my book. And um, initially, they, they didn't answer, but I kept, you know, nagging them. And finally, they said, well, um, they, they, you know, they wouldn't say yes or no. And I thought, you know, frankly, that's a topic I'm not, a tactic I'm not unfamiliar with. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, it's, it's cagier to refuse to reply. And that way they can always claim we know, well, we never said no. Okay. So I renewed my assault and I said, okay, forget the cover. Let me use it inside the book. You mm -hmm. know, and they said, okay, you've got to send us a book, then we'll decide. <laughs> like, I'm not sending you the book, <laughs> you know, but I compromised. I sent them um, the introduction. Mm -hmm. I said, that'll tell you enough about what I'm writing, you know, and they never responded again. So I couldn't get permission. So I couldn't use the image. And um, I'm pretty sure they were uncomfortable with what they read in the introduction. Sure. Yeah, so. Well, I wonder if it goes, um, you know, from historical perspective, uh, the concept of hero worship, Right, um, a lot mm -hmm. of, um, well, there's even stuff contemporary talking about a 1776 act where uh, young children in school would be taught quote unquote patriotic history. Yeah. <laughs> where, where George Washington is made of marble, not of, uh, is, is not human, is, is superhuman. And yeah. uh, so you, you refer a lot to Dr. Sims. Uh, you know, go back to that uh, video that you showed of the statue. Uh, and mm -hmm. its removal and whatnot. I mean, is that not a form of, I think you talked about honoring uh, the, in Germany, you showed evidence of honoring the victims, um, not the perpetrator. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that? Sure. You know, the interesting thing about defending statuary of heroes, whether it's Confederate generals or Dr. James Marion Sims, is that the criticism uh, the you know, criticism of taking down that statuary often revolves around its value as a historical document. They'll say, um, well, you're trying to change history. Um, it's better, you can't erase history. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that statues are not historical documents, nor are they intended to be historical documents. If you want to know the truth about Dr. Sims, read a book. The statue is actually... Um, means other things, depending on the statue, depending on the time. But look at Confederal generals. They, the, these, um, these were not erected around the time of the Civil War. Most of them were erected when there had been racially contentious changes in society. 
uh, the Voting Rights Act, elimination of discrimination. That's when the statues went up. These are examples of racial biopower to remind people who's in charge, to remind people who's in control. The Sim statue is not um, simply a statue to celebrate Sims. It's across from the Academy of Medicine. It actually epitomizes beliefs about American medicine. Um, who is really a hero? So I wrote in my nature piece that, you know, had had much more to do with enshrining these ideas of heroism than it does with any, any one doctor. Um, and the question is, should a statue of a doctor who abused women of color preferentially, who used them without their um, um, consent in research, should that statue be standing in the middle of a heavily black and Latinx community? People who live there don't think so. And what does it mean that it stands there? If it were just across from the Academy of Medicine, I would say the statue would have one meaning, but it's in a richly black and Hispanic area. So it has an additional meaning, it means a lot to the people who live there who don't wanna walk by that statue every day. So we have to not stop looking at statues as historical documents and look at them for what they are. Expressions about who determines, um, who's in control of the story, of the American story, who's in control of how we see, how we see an image, see a person, see a quality. Um, and that's, that's the real import there. Um, now, in terms of history, I also think that it's, you know, he wasn't a hero because of what he did. But that's, you know, there are others who might argue with that. But what you can't argue with is that he represents practices that were anathema to the people who lived there in that area. And all these things should be considered. And again, I can't say it often enough, stop mistaking these, um, you know, these statues and obelisks and things as historical documents. It's not, that's not their real meaning. That's not their real semiotics here. Thank you. Do you feel medicine in general um, is, is any more or less able, again, to look back historically and, and um, at least attempt to be objective, to be able to say, you know, there, there's certain things going on in our, in our world today that's simply questioning things that have happened in our past uh, once patriotism is being questioned. Um, so I guess my question is, do you feel in medicine, uh, are our doctors, are, you know, is medicine better able to look back with that um, contemplative uh, um, filter uh, for hopefully betterment or, or what's been your experience there? I don't know, but I, I, I know what I hope is true. What I hope yeah. is true is that as a society, we have changed enough that there is room for the stories of everyone to be told. Mm. You know, I am old enough to remember when, um, you know, physicians were essentially gods. They said X and you did X. There wasn't a discussion. There wasn't any negotiation that you didn't say, well, I want to explore alternative remedies. None of that happened. He, they just told you what to do and you did it. And, um, but the culture has changed. And now you can find physicians all over the map in terms of um, how they interact with patients. But I think what's really um, foundational is that physicians have, um, you know, their role has changed. They've embraced, embraced a role that goes beyond, um, you know, simple dictation to patients. And I think that in the same way, we've ended up with a canon of the history of medicine that is monochromatic, and basically elides the experiences of many people, in fact, most people. So, you know, women, people of color, uh, gender variant people, their stories simply don't appear in the medical can canon. It's been carefully curated. So that's what needs to change. And I think that we're, we're approaching the point where we're willing to do that, but only physicians themselves can decide if they're ready to do that. I think, you know, once doctors um, decide to do that, I think many, you know, many positive changes will come about just from that. Because if you begin doing that, if you begin looking at the experience of other people, then I think that empathy naturally flows from that. You know, um, a, lot of, a lot of physicians 
who might on the surface seem like, you know, they're biased or racist. Um, and maybe their actions are, you know, quite frankly, but sometimes it's a result of simply not knowing things. You know, they don't understand. For example, um, if they were trained by someone who impressed upon them that when an African-American woman in childbirth tells you she's in pain, don't really listen to her. She's exaggerating. She's malingering. You know, you can't simply give her more medication because she claims to be in pain. If he was taught that and that was drilled into him and he saw that modeled, then he, and then he, then he replicates that behavior. Well, how do you change that behavior? You know, the change comes about from seeing that, oh, the flip side of that is, there's been a long um, sustained mythology about African-Americans in pain, you know, and undertreating pain. And so it wasn't a factual basis. It's rather people's biases I've been internalizing. Anyway, changing the canon so that everyone gets to tell that everyone's story is told. Um, objectivity is a goal, I think. I'm not sure, I don't think it's a destination. But, you know, including other people goes a long ways to doing that, to approaching objectivity, um, because you're going to be more fair, you're going to encompass other people's perspectives, and you're going to learn more. You're going to learn things that um, you would not have learned simply reading about um, experiences filtered through people who look like you and had your experiences. That's my hope. That's why I think, you know, unveiling the history is so important. So I think that people of goodwill, when they see this, will do the right thing. And I can't speak for the others. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, at the beginning of your talk, uh, you spoke about hope and the fact of, um, you know, there, there's some big challenges ahead. Uh, but uh, I wrote down, you, you said, um, but, but I believe that we are up to the task. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing evidence uh, of that, 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 that gives you hope? Yes, I do. I do. Um, as somebody who often finds herself uh, surrounded by people younger than she is. Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> but um, I'm not an ageist, but I do see that, you know, younger people, you know, younger medical students and medical aspirants have a very much broader perspective. Um, I think, and, you know, I can't tell you why. Are they more malleable? Um, they've grown up in a different culture. For whatever reason, they're more open to this history. They're more open to... Um, inclusion, they're more open to um, facing some of the deficits in, um, you know, medical culture. And for that reason, I'm very optimistic, very optimistic. So. Wonderful. I have two more concepts I'd like to uh, kind of hit on, and I want to be respectful of time. I think we have about uh, uh, 10 to 20 minutes left here. Uh, the, the two concepts are, I, I would like to give you time to speak about other works, uh, your book, A Terrible Thing to Waste and the Erosion of uh, um, Medical Consent, uh, Informed Consent, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, especially events that have happened in, in this past summer, you know, George Floyd's uh, murder in, in Minnesota earlier this year, the recent uh, Breonna Taylor um, um, court decision or, or lack of indictments or whatnot, and so I'd like to give you permission. Would you prefer to talk about contemporary events and how your research in, in, in alignments? Because again, that concept, um, if, if you are unaware, uh, reacting to something you see on the news could be, uh, if you're unaware, it looks like an overreaction. But, um, but if it's based on 400 years of dehumanizing behavior, perhaps it's a very rational reaction. Um, yeah. So I want you, know, you to kind of steer this however you'd like it to go. Okay. There's so many directions to go in. <laughs> I don't yes. even know, but you know, I'll take a stab at it. The first thing I want to say is about the news. And I can say this as someone who spent decades as an editor at newspapers and magazines. What you see on the news does not reflect reality. What you see on the news reflects the perspective of people who curate the news. And so um, as someone who's kind of on the front lines of racial friction in news coverage um, at places like USA Today. Um, the reality is that it's a curated image and it's, you're not seeing everything that's happening. So also, as it, most people know, 
different publications have different perspectives and agendas and slants. So if you read the National Review, you'll get a very different portrayal of the same event than if you read the final call, for example. So, um, you know, the news is really difficult in that when people derive their information from the news and only focus on that, they're necessarily getting a very um, uh, curated view of what's happening. And that, that being said, you know, it's important to realize that portraying activities as rioting and looting, et cetera, heavily racialized in this country. Yeah. Uh, remember during Katrina, um, there were some news outlets who frankly said, you know, when white people were, um, you know, trying to survive by taking food from grocery stores and things like that, they described it fairly as saying, well, they're getting necess necessities to keep themselves alive. When black people do the same thing, oh, they're looting, you know. So how, all that having been said, I think that, you know, one of the really important things we have to do is try to understand how language is um, distorting our perception of medical culture. It hap I, I did a um, Journal of Law, Medicine, Ethics, I wrote an article about it, um, about the semantics of um, medical ethics. And basically, language is very powerful. In the case of African Americans and they really, with the medical system, it has really hobbled people's uh, ability to understand what's going on. For example, when I talk to some people about, um, in medical culture, I talk about how African American fear of medicine, much ballyhooed fear of medicine, is a direct result of a long history of being, um, you know, abused medical systems, but also a troubled present. People will say, oh yeah, the past abuses. Past abuses is language very common. But if you think about it, using that phrase means you're, you're saying that they're confined to the past, mm -hmm. but you're not giving any evidence of that. And in fact, it's not the case. You know, I wish they were all confined to the past, but they're not. But simply by saying that, you've like eviscerated half the argument because the other half of the argument is like these contemporary issues. For example, the deaths of George, as you mentioned, and Breonna Taylor, these are all part and parcel of um, their recent events, but they are part of a continuous unbroken string of wanton public murder by police officers. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I talk to my white friends, my, my white women friends about the case and I'm thinking, you will never understand because you don't have to worry about being asleep in your bed at 3 a.m. minding your own business and suddenly being murdered by police, you know? Um, African-Americans live in areas where that kind of thing happens, but you don't. And so, um, again, it's really important. For example, the news coverage focuses on things like, oh, was a person, okay, they always call them unarmed. I'm like, why are you saying unarmed? Most of us are unarmed. I'm unarmed. You know, why is that, you know, you know, why is that a criterion that you have to bring up? Because every time you do that, you're talking about someone lying in bed, sound asleep, a normal person, but you call them unarmed and you're immediately evoking in the reader's sense that, oh, well, they didn't have a gun on them. Well, why would they have, you know? So I think that language is really important. And to go down like a list of particular um, linguistic problems or semantic problems um, in the medical, medical experience is a little difficult, but I would say that I often give to physicians the example of um, talking to African-Americans about their fears and asking them, you know, well, why don't you want to undergo this particular thing? Anytime an African-American volunteers to you that they have a fear or suspicion about um, a medical procedure, that's a golden opportunity to engage with them. Because I know from experience, many African-Americans will not tell you that they're afraid. They will not respond. They will not show up, whatever. But if they actually open up and tell you that they're afraid or that they are worried or that someone they knew was abused in a hospital setting, um, that's a golden opportunity. You should then take that and try to engage with them about that. But all too often, what I hear doctors do in response to that is, um, 
oh, you don't have to worry about it because you're protected by X and Y. I would never do a thing like that. And then they will tell the person all the reasons why their fear is not, you know, is baseless. So when but they confide wrong. fear to you, it's a way of demonstrating trust. And maybe the better response is to say, thank you for trusting me. Let Help me understand better your concern or your fear rather than explaining it away. Well, yeah, well, it's a, I think it's a chance to open up a discussion, you mm -hmm. know, rather than dismissing their fear by telling them all the reasons why their fear is baseless, you know. Um, at that point, if it were me, and if I could, because I know about the time constraints, I'd probably ask them to tell me more. And hope, and you know, maybe they might tell me something that um, would be really useful in terms of having a better relationship. But all too often, I see that, you know, in their zeal to reassure people, doctors will shut down the conversation by telling them, oh, it's not a problem, you have to worry about that, the law protects you, sign here, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. not going to work. So um, Sign here. <laughs> um, that sounds like maybe an entree into the erosion of medical <laughs> consent. Would you like to talk yes. more about that? That's very important. Coronavirus 19 has, um, I think, opened, has showcased it, unfortunately. We see many more cases of this happening. But again, the news reports are not very illuminating. Um, so it's difficult for most people to understand that this is happening. One thing that's happening, for example, is in Newark, New Jersey, not far from where I live, um, you have EMTs on ambulances who are refusing to do CPR on people with coronavirus. They're afraid of contracting the disease. Reminds me of the early days of the HIV epidemic, where you had some caregivers refusing to care for people with HIV. Same kind of situation, and um, a poorly understood infection and disease, something people were afraid of, People who had a lot of suspicion about contracting it weren't sure how to protect themselves. And but the fact remains that, you know, when you become an EMT, you become a physician, um, most people see it that you have tacitly assumed that risk of caring for people who are sick and infectious. And um, I'm not here to say whether people should have the right to refuse or not, but it does signal something to your patients and people who are watching you, you know. Um, it seems a limitation of how much you care for them. But the reality is, too, that refusing care to coronavirus 19 patients while you offer it to other patients, is that really defensible? You know, the bottom line is that you're, you're in a situation where as a, as a patient where um, you have no control over whether you're going to get appropriate care or not, and you're not being warned about this. It's something that you encounter and then once you get into the hospital, the opposite problem happens. Um, DNR, do not resuscitate orders, are being um, issued blanketly for Corona-19 patients in some institutions. Not many, but that it should happen at all is really troubling. And again, it's happening with no transparency. People aren't aware of it. And it's something that happens within the hospital, opaque to your family, who can't follow you into the hospital and know what's going mm -hmm. on. And so you get into the hospital, if you're in the wrong institution and they don't, and they force a DNR on you, that's supposed to happen only with your consent. Then to, um, in 1996, as I pointed out earlier, um, two changes were made to the Code of Federal Regulations governing medical research. Trauma victims um, who are unconscious can legally be used in medical research studies without, not only without getting their permission and without notifying them. I've spoken to people who had um, artificial blood, polyheme mm -hmm. infused in them. No one told them that. Mm -hmm. They found out later from someone else by accident and it's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. Very frightening because American people do not know about this. They think that you have to give your consent for medical research, it's no longer true. And the waivers of consent are even worse in that, um, the rationale is that you're not subjecting people to more than um, um, normal risk. But more, but you know, first of all, it is risk. It's not supposed to be a draconian risk, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to say yes or no, but you don't. And k ketamine, you know, giving someone ketamine, you tell me, is that really normal risk or not? It's not something I expect to encounter every day. 
Not and it's to be being, taken lightly for sure. Right. And ambulance attendants have admitted in Minneapolis, they've been doing it at the behest of police officers. Police mm -hmm. officers will tell them, give that person ketamine. Why is a cop making a medical decision? You know, especially one like that. And the ketamine, of course, it's called no more than minimal risk, but it's not. I mean, many of the people, I have the exact percentage in um, in my book, but many of the people who are injected end up in ventilators. On They wake up in the hospital the next day on a ventilator because of oh. the ketamine. They were picked up because someone said they were drunk or loud or abusive, whatever. And sometimes they were none of the above, but they end up, you know, in this situation, without their will. They're part of an experiment. They're part of medical research that they never agreed to be in. Mm -hmm. So these are very troubling, but for African Americans and people of color, it's even worse because these are all legal cases, but there are many, many illegal cases that have taken place, not in the distant past, but you know, within our memory. You know, when we were on our uh, call a few weeks ago uh, in preparation for, you know, the presentation today and whatnot, you mentioned, you know, laws are only basically as good as the folks who enforce them and, and the folks who write them. So to your right. point, uh, there can be good people carrying out bad laws. And um, hopefully, as we raise awareness, uh, we'll do better going forward. I, I can't thank you enough. I, I've been given a, a prompt here that we're quickly running out of time. Um, I, I'm, I've, I've got my book in, in front of me again and, and quoting from the epilogue, uh, you know, today the worst abuses are mostly memories, although some forms of abuse and research persist. And you're talking about the erosion of informed consent there. Mm -hmm. um, we could get into, you know, basically what medical apartheid part two can and, and should look like. I, um, uh, Harriet, Ms. Washington, I, I can't thank you enough for, uh, again, this, this incredible work, your presentation here today. I believe we have a workshop scheduled with you in October. Yes. And uh, I would love to um, do more to work with you to see what we can do. You know, we're, we're doing this to hopefully give better care for our whole community right here in Southwest Michigan. And I want you to know that you've been a, a, a big part of um, moving us forward in a positive direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. All right.